Hello, I'm Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Today, why does Ethiopia's largest ethnic group consider themselves to be one of the most persecuted by their government? We'll look at the challenges faced by the Oromo people. Our digital producer Malika Balao is here looking out for your live feedback. Malika, right at the beginning of June, we had an open editorial meeting. We were asking our online community for story ideas about Africa. Mm -hmm. And this is why we're sitting here today with it this is. show. We've come full circle, and I love when that happens. So, journalist Mohamed Ademo was one of the people in that uh, open editorial meeting, mm -hmm. and he had this pitch. The, the story that the stream should be doing is a story about Oromo identity in diaspora and also marginalization uh, in Ethiopia and in, uh, the challenge that uh, Oromo immigrants and Oromo refugees are facing. I think people are dying to be heard. He says people are dying to be heard and if you want to be heard, we want to hear you. So use the hashtag AJStream. Joining us in the studio, sitting between Malika and myself, we have Jawa Mohammed. And Jawa is an Oromo rights advocate who was raised in Ethiopia's Oromia region. Jawa, it's great to have you in the stream. Thank you for having me. We will be hearing from you in just a little moment. So, the Oromo people make up about 40% of Ethiopia's population. But, according to human rights advocates, they lack equal political rights, face a widespread discrimination, and have long felt targeted by the Ethiopian government. So as a result, over many years, millions of Romos have fled their homeland to become refugees in other nations. So how did all of this happen to a group of people who make up almost half the country? To help us answer this is Fido Eber, the foreign affairs representative of the Romo Liberation Front. He joins us from Minnesota in the United States. And in New York, we have Mohamed Adimo. He is a journalist and editor of the Oromo News website, O Pride. Fido and Mohamed, it's great to have you in the stream. And before we start, I have to say that the Ethiopian government turned down our invitation to join in this conversation. This is an email that we received from their spokesperson, Shimalis Kamal, who writes, no government representative is authorized to share a forum with the Oromo Liberation Front leadership or involve in any media debate, as the OLF is officially prescribed as a terrorist organization. So that is why they're not part of this discussion, but I will be bringing in some of their viewpoints. Joart, let me start with you. It's really hard for outsiders to understand that if a group, an ethnic group, makes up 40% of the population of a country, why they feel persecuted. Why is that? I think the persecution and the discrimination goes back to how they are incorporated the, to the present day Ethiopia. About 100 years ago, they were conquered by the Ethiopian, the Abyssinian uh, state that were able to get a modern weapon earlier. From that on, they, they, their size became a curse. Their size and the wealth, they contribute about 60% of the GDP, they are about 40% of the population. So any uh, move to incorporate them to the state requires a redistribution of significant redistribution of wealth because of that and because Ethiopia has been ruled by dictators any dictator who want to incorporate the Oromo faces redistributing wealth and power because of this they continue to repress them in order to ensure that they never uh, get the fair share and uh, force any uh, the dictators out of power okay so so Malika and I and the team are trying to get an idea of okay what is it like to grow up a Romo what is it that is actually happening to you to make you feel persecuted, Malika. You're right, and we got this video comment uh, just on that, on, on what it is like um, to grow up as a, a member of the Oromo community, um, not in Ethiopia. Have a listen to this. I think often we take too lightly the power of identity and how being deprived of the opportunity to express that both socially and politically is both unjust and damaging. Living in a country like Australia as young Oromos, I think it's important that we continue to raise awareness about the plight that our people face. I mean, we have the opportunity to speak Oromo without being persecuted, to identify as Oromo without being persecuted, and that really challenges an entire system. So Sarati says that outside of Ethiopia, she has the ability to speak the language she wants to speak without being persecuted. What does that mean um, that it's like for Oromo in Ethiopia? Uh, now it's changing a little bit, but in the past, particularly during my grandfather and father's time, if you have an Oromo name, if you speak the Oromo, uh, Oromo language, you will be targeted, you will be identified as enemy, and you will be ridiculed socially, you will be politically uh, targeted, prosecuted, thrown to jail. Um, 
generally to be an Oromo in Ethiopia is either you have to change your identity and claim to be somebody else or uh, remain marginalized, lose uh, economic and political opportunities. So Mohammed, does this actually resonate with you? Does, does what Joa is saying, is that your experience when you were in Ethiopia? Absolutely. I mean, this is the experience of Oromos for several uh, decades and, and as far back as the century. There is this systematic cultural uh, and political and economic discrimination where you are uh, made to feel inferior and you don't come forward and speak. So you have to change your identity to fit in. And anything that deviates from there threatens the power balance. And, and, and uh, let's just remember that Ethiopia is an empire forged with iron and blood. In, in, in what continues to be ha to happen to Oromo is to use the same tactic uh, to hold on to uh, power so that the power uh, balance does not shift. Do you know, I've just been talking, we've been talking for a long time with the Ethiopian government. We were trying to get them to be part of this program. One of the things that they actually told us was they have a great deal of respect for the Aroma people. They say that the great Aroma people, whose rich history, customs and traditions constitutes one of the marvels of Ethiopian culture and linguistic diversity. So Fido, this sounds on paper incredibly respectful. Why are there so many grievances that you have? Well, the, the particularly the present government uh, controls um, everything uh, from the military um, monitoring institutions um, and, you know um, the, the government um, the bureaucracy so the Oromos are really scared um, uh, in, in the past it was very hard to identify oneself uh, uh, as an Oromo as my uh, colleagues have indicated in fact um, uh, unless you, you you identify yourself with uh, to, to um, with other groups, uh, you will be enslaved, and it was one of the 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 criteria by which a slave in Ethiopia used to be um, uh, taken. Uh, so Oromo woman uh, Oromo man uh, who follows the traditional Oromo um, uh, beliefs and the culture. Uh, these were targeted. In fact, today the same thing is holding on. Uh, to, in the past, the Amaras uh, ruled for almost 100 years. Then um, uh, the Tigrians came back now and they are ruling with uh, Iron Fist. Mm -hmm. uh, they represent almost 6% of the population. Uh, there is no democracy. There is no... There is uh, severe repression. Right. Uh, Okay. Well, you know, Femi, every so often we have uh, a day where we get so many comments online via Facebook, Google+, Twitter, and it's all before a show has even aired. Right. Now that the show is airing, we're still getting comments, but I just want to read a few of them. Hinoak on Twitter says, I was denied a job because I was a Romo and also was not a member of the ruling party. But on the other hand, we're also getting a lot of pushback. On Facebook, <laughs> Awa says, yes, there are a lot of problems in Ethiopia. However, singling out one tribe as a victim is a cheap shot to divide Ethiopia for the sake of other countries' interests. Mohammed, I want to pose that one to you. Since you pitched this, the idea for this show, uh, uh, clearly, as our community is saying, the Oromo aren't the only ones who are discriminated. There is no denying that the Oromo are not uh, the only one that are discriminated. And there are other several minority groups in Ethiopia that are facing similar uh, persecution. But that said, I want to comment on what the uh, Ethiopian government said. There's this great quote that I like from JFK that a nation that is afraid of the truth is afraid of its people. That's essentially what's going on. And this pushback that you see trying to uh, tie Al Jazeera to Egypt and saying Al Jazeera is playing a mouthpiece for Egypt because Egypt and Ethiopia has this stalemate in, in this pushback that you see from the communities, essentially what the Oromos have been fighting against is that people don't want the Oromo story to be told because Oromo is at the center of Ethiopia's problem. Ethiopia got an Oromo problem. Nobody wants to address it. The Ethiopian government does not want to talk about it. There is no political space for an Oromo to exercise their rights. So unless these people are willing to come to the center and, and talk about these issues and discuss the problems that clearly exist, which is evident from this conversation, the government not willing to talk to an Oromo uh, is, is, is the reason why uh, uh, there is this pushback and people need to get over it.
But it's a very specific reason the government said they didn't want to talk to Oromo. And, and Fido, I'm just going to bring you back in here for this because they actually said to us that the Oromo Liberation Front, as well known among the Oromo people, is an organization responsible for heinous crimes, countless atrocities, which its leaders perpetrated against innocent civilians. Fido, you are representing the OLF. How do you respond to that? That's false. Uh, in fact, um, uh, the, uh, the Oromo people love the Oromo Liberation Front, and that's, in fact, their uh, difficulty. Um, uh, one of their leaders said if uh, they want to uh, arrest um, uh, an OLF, uh, it would be difficult. They don't have enough um, uh, prisons uh, because um, Oromos believe in, in this organization. This is their institution. All right, but uh, how about the heinous... A lot of things, uh, to Fido, the Fido but how about yes. the heinous crimes? The uh, we, uh, countless we, atrocities? We are, uh, we are against violence. Uh, we want to solve this problem peacefully through negotiation. The Ethiopian government refused. Several times we have uh, asked by government, we have initiated the um, uh, talks for peace. They refuse because if OLF goes, uh, goes in and um, uh, uh, works uh, freely uh, among uh, the Oromo people and others, uh, then they will lose. They okay. don't want to lose. They, okay. As a minority, they, they are scared. All right, Mohammed, so let, we, Frida, we, let me just bring in Mohammed for something. Carrying, we are carrying arm, just protect ourselves. Right. Self-defense, we are in our country. We are depend. we, we don't go to uh, other places. We are working inside Oromia, in there, when we are among our people, um, we have to defend our people right. and ourselves from uh, these intruders. There's something I have to push back on, and Mohammed, I'm, I'm going to trust you as a journalist, and I want you to be completely transparent. So when the Ethiopian government talks about heinous crimes, countless atrocities, please at least enlighten us about one or two of these instances where they may say violence may have been used by the OLF. I'm certainly not preview to the information that the government is looking at, but what I do know, I can tell you as a journalist, and many other journalists who've covered in Ethiopia can tell you, is that the Ethiopian government is known to fabricate and produce fake documentaries to uh, accuse and also uh, persecute their opposition. And, and, and the, a very clear example of that is just about two months ago, a story that was also published on Al Jazeera was that uh, there, there has been uh, a growing Muslim movement in that country. Country. They produced a video essentially saying that this, the peaceful protesters on the streets of Addis Ababa have connection with terrorists uh, in Mali, in Nigeria, and uh, in other places. Totally something that is not related uh, where the protesters are in fact asking basic questions. So again, I, I don't have the information in front of me, but I'm not aware of any such heinous crimes. And, but I do uh, would like to emphasize that the crimes that the, this current government has committed against the Oromo and other ethnic groups really in that country amounts to uh, something uh, more dangerous uh, that we could call it uh, maybe ethnic cleansing in, in something of sure. that nature. So uh, I think what needs to happen is there's got to be some transparency from the government and accountability for their actions before they seek to hold others uh, accountable. Sure, see, I'm sure this is the point where the Ethiopian government wish they were part of this conversation. It's not too late. You can tweet us at AJ Stream. Malika. Well, we mentioned earlier some of the pushback, and some of it is coming in the form of, of email. Uh, an Ethiopian lawyer and blogger, Daniel Burhani, based in Addis Ababa, uh, sent us this. He says the OLF left the transitional government after committing around massacres on other ethnic groups. That was their ultimate undoing. The bottom line is an arrest of OLF operatives can't constitute a persecution of the Oromo. So are we conflating the wrong things, Joar? Are, are, are we um, equating persecution of Oromo? civilians uh, <laughs> with arresting operatives. Currently, there are 25,000 to 30,000 Oromo political prisoners in that country. Um, no doubt that some of them are all level operatives. But the vast majority of, I can say, nine out of 10 of them are teachers, students, who have nothing to do with the OLF. I can give you a couple of exa examples. There are Oromo peaceful opposition parties in the country operating within the constitutional mechanism. Their leaders, just a, a couple of years ago, 200 of their uh, leaders were thrown to jail. These people are known for advocating nonviolence. These people are uh, 
have never contested even the legitimacy of the state. They, con they, they could operate within the state, but they, they still throw them to, to, to jail. I want, I want to comment on a couple of things. Why, are, why, do, or why do you single out the Oromos? Oromos never single themselves out. They are singled out. As I said, nine out of ten of the political prisoners in Ethiopia are Oromos. Eight for, out for, of ten for, of for what? For what crimes? For political, uh, because they, they, they resist the government's imposition, exploitation of resources, they defend their rights, they, they speak their language, they refuse, and most importantly... You can get put in prison for speaking your language. For, for speaking your language, for, uh, for refusing to be a member of the ruling party. One of the most common crimes is, to, if you refuse to be a, a member of the ruling party, you become that. So, just this, let me just get, let Mohammed jump in here as well, just share the conversation, because I know, Mohammed, you were in prison. What did you want to say? Femi, I was just going to uh, mention that uh, in, in Ethiopia today, as we speak, every dissenting Oromo is taking us our left by extension a terrorist. And that's essentially why I went to jail. As growing up in Ethiopia as a student activist, the, the, the questions that we were asking when I was a high school student was, there was a fire that was engulfing forest, forest in, in Oromo areas. And we only asked to be allowed to go put out the fire, which the government did not want to take any action against. Those are some of the crimes why these people arrest innocent young people, put them in jail and, and, and call them terrorists or, or put them, give them some other levels. And, and you know, uh, this is the story of uh, many Oromo students uh, who are forced to leave the country, now living in refugee camps in the Horn of Africa and others, so, you know, at times in, in hundreds. So uh, I think uh, the, this notion that uh, what is in jail and, and people that are arrested are, uh, are oil left operatives is, is totally uh, a way of uh, not answering or addressing the problem uh, uh, from my point of view. Okay, Joa. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I think uh, I think we have to focus on. Fido, I hear you. We'll, we'll come back to you. I, I think we have to focus on why the government is doing what it does. It's it boils down to resources. Oromos contribute to up to 60% or 65% of the, G the country's GDP. Most of the coffee, Ethiopia's number one export is coffee. Most of the coffee comes from, uh, from, from Oromia. Ethiopia, e Ethiopia's economy is based on, Ethiopia, based on the Oromo people. If it allows dissent among Oromos, this dissent can grow into demand for redistribution of resources and control over the, uh, their resources. That means the, the, the ruling party, particularly the Tigrayan ruling party, will lose power. Remember, the TPLF has this corporation called Effort. It controls 50% of the country's economy, but Tigrayan represents 6%. So if the Oromo dissenting voices are allowed, activists and teachers are allowed to mobilize their people, there is going to be significant reduction on this rent that is collected by the ruling party. Okay, so Joao, I'm just curious, are you Oromo first or Ethiopian first? I am an Oromo first, because it, to, to me, Ethiopia, first Ethiopia is imposed on me, the second, the second important point is that uh, because we are forced to denounce our identity, we end up re reaffirming and reasserting our identity. Uh, that's uh, how we explain it. Fido, the reason why the government isn't on this program is because of you, because you are representative of the Oromo Liberation Front. How do you see Ethiopia, how do you see Oromos reconciling so you're all one Ethiopia rather than this major group, this major ethnic group, feeling they have a lot of grievances. Where do you go to now? What's the way forward? Um, I, I just want to uh, illustrate uh, the degree of, of oppression uh, on the Oromo people by just mentioning two things. One, the number of people in prison is not Oromo speaking, but others talk, uh, indicate that over 90% of the, uh, the prisoners in the federal prison are Oromos. Live alone in the Oromia region, of there, of course, completely uh, there are Oromos. Thousands, thousands. The international community, part of the international community this, uh, knows this, but they keep quiet. Second, the number of refugees. I'll just give you an example. Just in uh, 2012, over 110,000 refugees uh, crossed over into right. Yemen. Out of this, 90,000 were Oromos. Okay, so we so see we I see that we see the, the, the enormity of the we see the enormity of the problem. I just want to bring Malika in here because it would be nice to get a sense of what you as Oromos outside of Ethiopia feel the way is 
the way forward is. Right, there are, are a lot of tweets about solutions. Um, I'm glad, though, that Fido brought up refugees. We'll get to that in the post show, so a little tease for that. But on Twitter, Rakari says the Aromo people want control of their futures. We can no longer trust others to rule over us because we've been exploited. Uh, but Jawar uh, on Facebook, Hashim says that's not going to happen because of lack of collective action due to ideological differences among Aromo leadership. So what is the way forward? How do you solve those ideological differences? Well, it's a nation of some 45 million people. No doubt there are some ideas, some differences, some smaller factions. That's inevitable. Here and it's inevitable. However, the Oromos from left to right, from moderate to hardliners, they, there is absolute and solid consensus on the right of the Oromo people to self-determination. On, their, on, on the demand that their, uh, their resources be used for, for their development, on, on the demand that prosecution, uh, 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 political prosecution, political repression and cultural ma marginalization end. On this major point uh, there is consensus. Through that, there is a lack of uh, uh, collective action. There are some 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 problems in, in mobilizing towards that, uh, that direction. But this is a journey towards nation building. We are, we are facing a very uh, determined state, supported by China, United States, and various international actors. Uh, the adversity is very high. However, the determination among Oromo people is very strong. So I do believe that sooner or later, uh, we are going to emerge victorious. Journey to nation building. I like that. I have to write that down. <laughs> So we will continue this discussion. It's not over yet at stream.aljazeera.com in the post show. But first, Malika has a look at some of the other stories the stream is following. Buddhists in Myanmar are speaking out against a Time magazine cover story on so-called Buddhist terror. The article shows the face of controversial monk Wiratu, who was jailed for inciting anti-Muslim sentiment and was released under an amnesty agreement last year. But online, many said Wiratu doesn't represent the Buddhist community as a whole. The combination of these two words, Buddhist and terror, are very sad for every Buddhist. Our way is a peaceful way and not for terrorists, reads a petition on avaz.com. Well, in just two days, that petition received more than 65,000 signatures, politely requesting time reevaluate their cover choice. The controversy also caught the eye of Myanmar's president, who said the article could be detrimental to the trust building between religions. We turn to Egypt next, where netizens are gearing up for a mass rally against President Mohamed Morsi. The current leaders, they do not represent our Islam. They don't represent our beliefs. They do not represent Egyptians. A movement called Tamarud, or rebel in Arabic, is calling for early presidential elections and labels Morsi's presidency thus far a, quote, total failure. Well, last week, the campaign said it had gathered 15 million signatures on a petition against Morsi. And organizers are planning a national protest on June 30th, the first anniversary of his inauguration. But the movement has been met with skepticism. Shadi Hamid tweets, Haven't heard clear explanation of mechanism by which opposition brings down Morsi on June 30th. As far as I can tell, no legal way to do it. Well, we'll keep an eye on the planned protests. And as always, we want to hear your stories. So tweet your stream lead suggestions. My handle is mmbilal and Femi's at Femi OK. So you know the floodgates will be open now. I can already see comments coming in. Talking about comments on Facebook, for the last 24 hours. People are mean about the Oromos, Joa. They are very mean. This comes from both the government doing it and also historically it's built up. Everything Oromo has been associated with, associated, associated with uh, threat to the state, right. uh, disintegration of the country. Uh -huh. uh, I can post a, a song on, on a Facebook and immediately people will be coming with negative comments because wow. they fear there is, they have built a, a lot of uh, hatred and fear towards Oromo. So this phobia okay. is actually you know, the one factor that is blocking uh, conversation among the people. All right. We'll have more of that in the post show at stream.aljazeera.com, where our conversation about the Aromos will continue. And as for the next show, different subject equally as controversial. Are white students at a disadvantage when they apply for college in the United States? Maybe affirmative action has gone a little bit too far. We will find that out tomorrow. In the meantime, you know where to find us. We'll be online. Thanks for watching.
Hello there. I am just typing in, looking up the stream, and our Facebook page is not there yet, so don't go to my laptop. I'm in mid-type here. You're back in the post show, and we're talking about the rights of Ethiopia's Oromo people and ways to improve the situation. So on set, we've got Joa Mohammed. He's an Oromo rights advocate. On Skype, we've got Fido Eber, a representative of the Oromo Liberation Front. Also on Skype, Mohammed Ademo, a journalist and editor of the Oromo website, O Pride. So... Yesterday, I'm looking at the stream's website. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the Aroma people. I'm reading the Facebook comments and my eyes are burning up. It's so <laughs> controversial. And people are mean. What did you see? <laughs> they are. That's a little bit of an understatement. Yeah. Almost. So I, I pulled it up on my screen here. This right. is the story page. And it was on here that we got more than 126 comments, but also on Facebook, on Google+, on Twitter. They've been coming in. They've been rolling in, rather. Um, a lot of them look like this tweet uh, from As Asigid, who says, Do you have objective evidence that shows Aromo is the only ethnic subject to repression? Why do you want to single out the Aromo anyways? Jawar, do you want to tackle that? I think that's, a, that's an interesting question, particularly coming from, the Ethiop from Ethiopians. As I mentioned earlier, the, the Oromos never singled themselves out. They are pushed out. They are forced to identify as, as a single group, as a, a different group, and uh, fight back because the government, the current government and the past government have deliberately, systematically targeted them. As, as we said earlier, nine out of ten of the political prisoners are Oromos. Uh, eight out of ten of the refugees in Yemen every month 10,000 or almost cross to Yemen. In Kenya, the refugee camp, most of them, 80% of them are almost. In Egypt, as you saw uh, in your show. When it comes to economy, there is huge land grab going on in Ethiopia. Out of some 3, mil uh, 3 million hectares of land the government has given to foreigners, some 1.8 million of them are from, from the Oromo land. Therefore, the Oromos have been subjected, selectively targeted. And when you are sel selectively targeted, you have no other option but as a targeted group to co coalesce together, to, to come together and fight back. That's why Oromos fight back. It's not because they hate other people. It's not because they deny that other people are uh, victims of uh, re repression. But the Oromos, by being Oromo, you are see you, the government, as you saw in your email, every time the name Oromo mentioned, the government secretizes the question. The, every time the Oromo comes, it is anti-state, it's anti-government. Because of that, people are forced to come together as Oromos and fight back. It's not that because we don't want to work with other people. We do work with other people. We work with Ogadenis, with Amharas, with everybody. The difference is that we, we are forced to fight back more than anybody else. We are, we are, we are targeted, selected, and we're just responding to that. So, Mohammed, the way that I see this, because everybody tries to understand a problem with their own sort of circumstances. So, I belong to a very large tribe known as the Yoruba tribe. Um, and I think one of the issues, certainly in the African continent and, and parts of the Middle East, is this tribalism. And, and that maybe the way forward to work as an integrated society and integrated communities is to maybe forget the tribe and think of the whole nation. And I think that's probably a lot of the pushback that you're getting as a Romos. Couldn't it be more important to be part uh, of a nation than Maka, part of a group? Th th that's yeah, not yeah, the so way we, we think. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, Peter. we uh, there are over 80 uh, different ethnic groups in Ethiopia. The Oromos border live um, as, as neighbors with all of this. We intermarry. Uh, we live among each other. We learn each other's language. Oromo doesn't doesn't hit anybody, any group. But when we are struggling, we are also cooperating our um, struggle um, for liberation, for freedom, for peace, for equality with our neighbors. We, if our neighbors don't have peace, we don't have peace. We fully understand this. So we don't discriminate others. We love others. We, 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 we are um, part of us uh, is our neighbor. So Mohammed, when we were talking about people complaining on Facebook about the aromas, you sort of chuckled a little bit. What do you hear from other Ethiopians when they know that you're an aroma and they're not? I mean, it's, it's like you said, this is a great conversation starter, uh, you, would, you, you would think, because if I meet an American in, in, in New York and I'll tell them, hey, I'm a Romo, they would ask me, what is a Romo? But mm -hmm. if you tell an Ethiopian person, I'm an, I'm an Romo, and you don't say I'm Ethiopian, that they, wanna, they don't want to talk to you. But I think on the way forward, Femi, like, like you suggested, I want to bring in the, the, the experience of South Africa in here. Defeating apartheid system in South Africa requ required a grand coalition of black people 
white people, Indians, and people of other color. And I think if people are really serious about addressing the problem of democracy, lack of democracy, lack of human rights, press freedom, where I cannot go and do a show like Al Jazeera Stream, which I would love to do, that's everything I dream and hope to do in the future. Are you angling for a job there, Mohammed? <laughs> <laughs> so in order for something that, like that to happen, people need to get over their fear. Uh -huh. Oromos are not fighting any group. There is, there is one thing that I want to say in here. In, for the last hundred years, only two ethnic groups controlled political power in that country. If names change, there is one thing that remains. Ethiopia still acts as an empire. That needs to change. People need to get over their, their, their fear in, 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 in vision. Talking to Oromos, we don't talk enough because people are scared to talk to me the minute I say I'm an Oromo. Right. People need to get over that and come forward so that we can find a democratic, uh, it, it build the democratic institutions where people can dare to dream and create the future in the country that they want. Right. Fida, we're coming to the closing moments of the program, but I really do want to get a closing thought for you that takes us forward. What's the message that you would leave us with as, as an international community so we understand you much better? Yes, um, as Oromos, we love peace. Uh, our organization, the Oromo Liberation Front, um, have tried to make peace with this government. We don't have a partner uh, for peace. Uh, we want to bring stability, peace for our uh, to our uh, neighborhood. The Horn of Africa is in turmoil, a lot of suffering, continuous war. Particularly, Ethiopia has been in war for, you know, uh, as long as I remember. Wars, wars. We want to overcome this, and we appeal to the international community okay. to put weight on the Ethiopian government who is persecuting not only Oromo, other nationalities in, in, in that country. Uh, right. And they, they are using the uh, terrorism term and concept to uh, harass journalists and politicians and other groups of people. They are the terrorists, okay. actually. Thank you. Joa, this is such a controversial subject. What, what I'm hearing right now is so the Ethiopian government won't come to the table, even in a, in a, a small conversation like this. So I hear stal stalemate, but what do you feel about the future for the Oromo people? I think the first thing is uh, it's up to Oromos. Unless Oromos are fully organized, e exert if sufficient pressure on the government, break its will to govern uh, at ease, there's not going to be solution. The second is, you know, this is not only just issue about Oromos. Oromos is the largest group in the region. And almost all of these regions, all of these countries border Oromos. As, as long as Oromos are not given freedom, there's, gonna be, there's not going to be stability among right. the, um, in Ethiopia. If there is no stability in Ethiopia, there's no stability in the region. That's a very important thing. But I want to comment one thing the, about those people who push off. The thing, there is, the government has secretized the Oromo question so much that it has created oromophobia. Whenever there is an oromophobia, or it has created oromophobia, <laughs> whereby, whereby, uh, I've got a romophobia from the website. If, actually, if you, if you ask, if you ask the uh, ordinary Ethiopian <laughs> when the name when the name uh, Oromo comes up, all they hear, they hear is about disintegration of the country, war, right. and others. Oromo is not. Oromo is about peace. Oromo is about freedom. Oromo is about politi uh, political and economic. And Oromos love to chat, and we're going to wrap it up there. But <laughs> do you have aromophobia, Malika? I don't. Not really? yet. Not, not <laughs> yet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, but I have a really good ending tweet from Ebo who says the fate of Aroma people is intertwined with other peoples of Ethiopia. Let us make the land comfortable for all. Oh. Thank you. Hear, hear. So on the next show, different subject, but equally as controversial. Are white students at a disadvantage when they apply for college in the United States? Perhaps affirmative action has gone a little bit too far. I know you'll be tweeting us about that, but that's tomorrow. Until then, you know where to find us. We'll be online. Thanks for watching. Aromaphobia.